morning, Bright City, and happy Sunday. My name is Lexi, and I serve on our liturgical team, and we are so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. It's always such a joy to be able to come together on Sunday morning and worship and hear the Word of God together. And if this is your first time with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you, and we are so glad that you're here. Whether you're new with us or you've been here a long time, one of the things that we like to remind everyone in our church of every Sunday is why we exist, which is to help you take your next step towards Christ. Because we believe that wherever you're at in your relationship with the Lord, He is still drawing you nearer to Himself, and we want to partner with you on that journey. If this is your first Sunday, though, this is a great time to fill out a Connect form. You can find it by scanning this QR code here and just fill out a little bit of information so we can reach out to you and get to know you a little bit better. Or you can stop by the First Steps booth on your way out in the lobby. And that's a really great place to get any questions you have on your mind answered. And we would love to chat with you there. If you call Bright City your home, there are a few things we want to invite you to be a part of to join the life of our church. And the first one is to partner with Bright City through giving. We believe that giving is one of the ways that we tangibly demonstrate the priority of our God of God in our lives. And so if that's something that you're ready to jump in on, you can scan this QR code here or you can go to brightcitychurch.com and you can set up automated giving that way. Another way that we would invite you to be a part of the life of our church is through serving. And there are so many wonderful servant leader teams that you can get involved in here on Sunday morning or throughout the week to be a part of uh, forming the people in our church and ministering to our community. So wherever you have gifts and talents and passions, we would love to get you plugged in on a team. You can scan the QR code and you'll find the servant leader link there. But this morning, we want to give a special shout out to our Kids City volunteers. Can we give them a round of applause? We are so grateful for all of the people that come together to help minister to our kids and disciple them. And if that is something that you are interested in joining, we do have a need right now for three more volunteers in our nursery team and three more volunteers on our preschool team, just as our church continues to grow. And we have so many uh, friends in the preschool and nursery ages. So if that's something you're interested in, we would love to have you. That is also someplace I get to serve is in the preschool and every once in a while in the nursery. And it's just such a joy to be in there. So if you haven't done that yet, I would really encourage you to consider it um, and you can fill out that same form to get involved and we'll reach out to you about that team. We have a lot of announcements that we can't get to on a Sunday as our church grows, which is a wonderful problem to have, but we want to make sure that you get all of that info. So if you're not on our newsletter list, this is a really great way to know what's going on in our young adults ministry and our youth ministry with our outreach teams. So you can grab uh, the link in that QR code and you can sign up for a weekly email where you can get all of our announcements throughout the week. And then the last reminder I have for you is that there is still time to sign up for a small group. So if you're not in a small group yet, or maybe you need to switch small groups this semester uh, for a new phase of life or for a different night of the week, this is a really great time to do it. The deadline is the 31st, which is in just a couple of days. So I would encourage you while you're here, go ahead and either fill out that form or chat with somebody in the lobby uh, while it's fresh on your mind. But we would love to get you plugged into a small group this semester. That's all I have this morning, and I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie for our scripture reading. Good morning, Bright City. Uh, My name is Stephanie Hughes, and I serve on the liturgical team here. And I'd like to invite you to stand, if you are able, for the reading of God's Word. And this morning, we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. For the kingdom of heaven is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one, he gave five talents to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. And then he went on a journey. And immediately the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man who with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And the man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, You gave me five talents. See what I've I've earned, five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. And the man with two talents also approached, and he said, Master, you gave me two talents, and see, I've earned two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. 
And the man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. And his master replied to him, You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers, and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good-for-nothing servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Stephanie. You guys can be seated. Well, I want to reiterate something Lexi said, which is, if you are new here, we would love an opportunity to meet you. We have lots of new faces around here, and so uh, we'd love to help you feel at home here, answer any questions. And so after the service, I will be at our sort of new here booth. It's in the corner on your way out. Be sure to stop there. We've got a little gift for you, but um, we'd love to help answer any questions about Bright City. Uh, But this morning, as we continue our series on the priorities of Jesus, I wanted to share something uh, that maybe you don't know about me, which is I love ice cream, like capital L-O-V-E, love ice cream ice cream. And along with that comes uh, a problem, which is when I begin to eat ice cream, I have a hard time stopping. And I will tend to eat it until it's almost all gone. But that causes a common experience for Sharon in our house, which is uh, maybe we've gone to the grocery store to get some ice cream and we bring it home and a couple of days pass and Sharon decides after dinner that she wants some chocolate ice cream out of the freezer. And so she'll go to the freezer to pull out the ice cream and open it up and there is literally one scoop left. That's all that's left. And two questions come to mind, which is, when did he eat all this ice cream? Because I tend to eat in secret. And two, why didn't he just finish it? Like, why did he leave one bite left? It's kind of like my calling card, like the wet bandits or something. Like, this, there's just going to be one scoop left. I don't know. There's probably shame in there. I don't know what it is. But all that to say, I love ice cream. I have a hard time not eating it when I know it's in the freezer. But that was one of the, uh, Sharon's favorite stories from when we were dating is uh, we were talking on the phone one night after dinner and I am at home and I'm craving some ice cream and so I'm going to drive to Harris Teeter to get some ice cream. I get there, walk up to the freezer with the ice cream in it and I'm looking at all the flavors trying to figure out what I want. But I also am beginning to realize, okay, if I get this, I know that I'm going to eat all of it and I'm going to feel terrible I'm going to feel awful. I'm going to feel awful about myself. Like this is, this is, there's going to be a whole lot of things that come with me getting this ice cream. And so in this moment, I decide, you know what? Rather than me getting this and trying not to eat all of it, I'm just not going to get any. And so even though I had come to Harris Teeter for ice cream in particular, I decide to turn around, walk out of Harris Teeter, and leave with nothing. Now, Sharon sees that as this great, like, exercise of self-discipline. It was more for me. I just knew like this was going to lead to a bad place. This was not going to be comfortable. But there was a certain amount of freedom in that moment, right, from this, this love of ice cream to be able to say no. Freedom is, uh, one way of thinking about it, is being able to look into the face of something and say, I really want this right now, but in the bigger scheme of things, I wish I had prioritized this over my desire for something else in the moment. As we look at this series on the priorities of Jesus, the question that we have been asking throughout this series is, are we free to prioritize the priorities of Jesus? That in order for us to change our priorities to match the priorities of Jesus, we have to be free enough from the things that demand our attention, that demand that they be prioritized. And so we've been looking at the things that sort of our lives are currently organized around and ask how do we experience freedom from those so that we can experience and prioritize the things of Jesus. To prioritize something, one way to think about that is to organize your life in such a way as to make that priority possible. 
And typically when it comes to changing our priorities, the thought that we have or the way that we tend to approach it is I'll just add this on top of everything else. I'll just move this from fourth or fifth in my life to first in my life. The problem with that mentality is it's, we already live very full, busy lives. For many of us, there's not room to just add something else on top. I'm sure many of us would say we don't have gobs of time to just add in a new commitment. We don't have gobs of money laying around just waiting for a new financial priority to present itself. And so what that means is when it comes to changing our priorities, it means that we have to reduce or remove something currently in our life in order to make room for something new. Throughout this series, as we've looked at the priorities of Jesus, we have looked at Jesus' priority of care for the marginalized and uh, his priority of community and having community. And I think for many of us, that's one of the great challenges to community is we can't just add a small group onto the rest of our life. We just don't have time for that. And so the only way to change that and to make that possible is we have to reorganize our lives in a way that makes that possible. This morning, we are looking at another of Jesus' priorities, which was the priority of generosity. Uh, That Jesus prioritized generosity, and generosity can take many forms. It can be a generosity with our time, generosity with our attention, with our energy. Uh, But in particular, we're going to be looking at generosity with our finances and how Jesus emphasized and prioritized generosity financially. Now, I want to kind of make a a PSA here. Some of you, maybe this is your first time with us, your first Sunday, and you're like, seriously, the first Sunday I come and we're talking about money? I want to be clear, this is not something we talk about every week. We're not beating you over the head, that kind of thing. But we do believe it is a priority of Jesus, and so it's important for us to reflect that in our teaching as well. But as I prepared for this message this week, I really wanted to know, what did Jesus do with his money? I know that we, you know, Jesus talked a lot about money. He uses it in lots of parables. I think something like one third of his teachings are around money or using money as a metaphor. But what did Jesus actually do with his money? Because we can talk a lot about the right thing to do with our money, but actually doing the right thing with our money is something else. And so what do we see Jesus handling money? Where do we see him making transactions? And The truth is, there's not a ton of that. We don't see a ton of Jesus actually handling money. Uh, The few things that we do see is at one point, Jesus is questioned about whether they should pay taxes to Caesar. And Caesar's response is, to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Another place that we see Jesus making a sort of financial transaction is he's questioned about whether to pay the temple tax. And he, in particular, they question Peter and ask, you know, does your teacher pay the temple tax? And so Peter comes to him and, and they're talking about this. And Jesus says essentially that because they are sons of the king, they are exempt from paying this tax. But to kind of keep the peace, he tells Peter, hey, go and go fishing and catch a fish. And when that fish comes up, there's going to be a coin in its mouth. I want you to take that coin out of its mouth and go pay the temple tax for you and for me. And I'm like, That sounds like a pretty good way to pay taxes. (laughs) I wish it worked out that way for me. Let's just go fishing. We'll get some coins. We'll go pay taxes. It'll be taken care of. One other thing that we know about Jesus and his handling of finances is that we know from Luke 8 that there were several women in particular who provided financial support for Jesus and his ministry. But with all of these, we don't really get a sense for what that says about generosity. How do we know that Jesus was generous? How do we know that he prioritized generosity? There's a couple of episodes or things that happen in the Gospels that I want to look at that I think demonstrate this priority for us. The first is the event of the wedding at Cana. Uh, In John chapter 2, this is early in Jesus' ministry. He hasn't really done a lot of miracles at this point. Uh, But Jesus and some of his disciples go to a wedding. And while they're at this wedding, in the middle of this wedding, the wedding party runs out of wine. Uh, The host of the wedding runs out of wine. And at any time, this would be humiliating. But especially in this day and age, to run out of wine would have been incredibly humiliating for the family hosting this wedding. 
And so in the middle of this, essentially, Jesus' mother kind of nudges him, kind of like, aren't you going to do something about this? And paraphrasing here, but Jesus is essentially like, it's not my problem, ma. And I kind of envision in this story, Mary just kind of cutting her eyes at Jesus. And Jesus is like, okay, okay. And so Jesus goes and he tells them to gather six of these cisterns, these that were used for ceremonial washing, and he tells them to fill them with water. They fill them with water, and then he tells them to dip some out and take it to the head of the party. So he goes, and they dip it out, and the, the master of ceremonies, the one running the party, is just blown away by the quality of this wine. And he's shocked that they've kind of waited and now, just now, are bringing out the best wine. But one of the things that's crazy about this story is that when you calculate how much wine this would have been, it would have been in the equivalent range of about 270 bottles of wine. I mean, we're talking about plenty of wine for this wedding and the next wedding and wedding all year long. Like, plenty of wine. And I think for some of us in this moment, we might would have thought, you know, okay, here we are. This wedding is out of wine. This seems like kind of an opportunity all right, supply is low, demand is high. We can sell this stuff for a premium and make a killing right now, right? Like this, this would be a great way for us to bring in some cash. But instead, Jesus just gives it all away. Now, when we think of Jesus, that, that doesn't seem surprising. But I think for many of us, it would have been an opportunity, right? And so we see this incredible generosity on display in this moment. Another story that we see is in most of the gospel. I think it's actually in all five of the gospels, the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus has been teaching all day. They are out on this countryside, and there's 5,000 men, which means there's probably 15 to 20,000 people total. And they can tell that the people are starting to get hungry. And so Jesus kind of looks at his disciples, and it doesn't say that it was like a joke, but it kind of feels like a joke when he says to them, hey, let's go buy them some food. Where are you going to get food for 15,000 people? It's kind of like Jesus is just waiting for their reaction. But eventually Jesus is like, no, 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 okay, just bring me what you've got. And they bring five loaves and two fish. And Jesus begins to multiply the bread and the fish. And again, for many of us, this is an opportunity. Supply is low, demand is high. It's kind of like, where else are they going to go? We are the only show in town. It's an opportunity. But again, Jesus gives it all away. And doesn't just give it all away, but there are leftovers. Twelve baskets full of leftovers. Again, demonstrating Jesus' abundant generosity. He doesn't see this as an opportunity to take advantage of their economic situation, but to help relieve their economic situation. And so we see time and again Jesus' generosity. But also, another thing about why we don't see Jesus handle much money is because, in fact, Jesus doesn't handle a lot of money. Judas is the one who handles the money bag for the disciples. John chapter 12, we learned this. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. So Judas was the one who handled a lot of Jesus' finances. I want to pose a potentially challenging question for us here, which is a lot of times when we 
hear teaching on finances and money in the church, there's a lot of emphasis on financial wisdom or good stewardship or making wise financial decisions. But then we look at this and we think, okay, if Jesus knew that Judas was a thief, and surely he knew, why did he entrust the money bag to Judas? Kind of think, like, come on, Jesus, didn't you know better than this? Come on, like, if you expect us to exercise good stewardship, this doesn't feel like good stewardship. This feels a bit irresponsible. Why did you entrust the money bag to a thief? I think the answer lies in one of the most often referenced passages from Jesus about financial wisdom and good stewardship. It comes from the parable of the talents, which we read for our scripture reading this morning. And as we look at this passage, there's a few things that I want to draw out because I think we, maybe if you've been in church for a while, you've heard this taught on when it comes to financial wisdom and stewardship. But there's a few things about how we read it that I think are really important that we don't miss. The first thing is that in this parable, the money does not become the servant's money. I think a lot of times when it's taught, it's kind of like, the equal of us being given money to live on, to care for ourselves, and then on top of that, we then manage that for God's kingdom. But when we read the passage, verses 19 through 21, it says, After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have earned five more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. In other words, the servant doesn't become the owner of these funds. He has merely managed them, and because he has managed them well, the master is going to place more in his care, more for him to be responsible for. The reason that this is important It's because when it comes to our finances, it's important for us to remember that whatever God entrusts to us financially, God remains the owner. We are simply the managers of what he has entrusted to us. And that may feel uncomfortable. We may have a knee-jerk reaction to that, kind of, no, I worked hard for this money. I earned this money. This is my money. But if we really take seriously that God is God and we are not, everything we have is because of him. And as Job says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. This is a little bit of what it means, I think, to live in fear of the Lord is to recognize that everything we have is a gift. Something for us to manage, but it remains that God is the owner The second thing that's important for us to see in this passage is that the master's priorities determine what the servant does with it, not the servant. Verse 24 in this passage says, The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering what you haven't scattered. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours His master replied to him, you evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. What we see with this third servant is that he managed the money according to his own priorities, which was his protection. His priority was caring for his own fear of what might happen if he mismanaged this. If he had given him a coin and he brought less than that back. But what we are called to do as servants of the master is to manage the, the, what's entrusted to us according to the priorities of the master. That the way that we manage what's entrusted to us should reflect the heart and desires of the master. 
And then the third thing that we see here is that there are consequences for mishandling what is entrusted to the servant. I want to be clear here that this is not a threat, but again, this is an important thing for us to understand about what is entrusted to us. What is not granted to the third servant, which we see granted to the first two, is is that the master says, well done, good and faithful servant, come and share in your master's joy. That when we manage what's been entrusted to us well, we actually experience the master's joy. And I think this is important because on some level, I would imagine a driving force behind how we spend our money, regardless of our income level, is to experience on some level, some level of happiness in what we buy. Or some level of security because of what it gives us. Or some comfort because of what it affords us. In short, I think we manage our finances the way that we do in pursuit of of joy. John Mark Comer in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, writes this. <clears throat> he says, materialism has become the new dominant system of meaning. We now get our meaning in life from what we consume. We even get our identity from the things we buy or sell. Most of us would never admit it, but many of us believe the saying, I am what I buy. Or more realistically, I am what I wear. Or the brand of my phone or the car I drive, or the neighborhood I live in. Things aren't just things, they are identities. That these things that we invest our resources into on some level are giving us something that when we invest in them, when we put our money into these things, are actually stealing the opportunity for us to experience the master's joy. This week as I was working through this, and there's always moments of conviction as you're preparing a sermon, it speaks deeply to you. And as I was thinking through this call to manage resources according to the master's priorities, felt some level of conviction that we, in our own finances, Sharon and I, haven't been as diligent with our budget as we should be. That we, and along the way somewhere, developed this mentality, well, if I, as long as I have enough to cover what we purchased, then it's all good. And in reading this and, and reflecting, realizing that I had the wrong goal, the goal is not just to have enough to cover what we purchased, the goal is managing what God has entrusted to us according to his priorities, not ours. And so we find ourselves searching for meaning and happiness in the things that we buy. And in the process, we were missing out on sharing in the master's joy. I think this is what brings us back to Judas and Jesus entrusting the money bag to Judas. That he had kind of handed the money bag with all that was in it over to Judas to manage it. And as I thought about Judas managing this money, sitting in this place of sort of self-righteousness, even over Jesus, like, Jesus, why did you give the money back to Judas? Sort of criticizing Jesus. This was irresponsible. The Holy Spirit kind of breaks into that moment and says, well, what's the difference between Jesus giving the money back to Judas and God giving the money back to you? If God is the owner and we are the managers, have I never dipped my hand in the bag? Have I never dipped my hand into the bag of what's been entrusted to me? Have I never prioritized indulging myself over the priorities of the owner? The point here is not to say that we can't ever enjoy nice things or go on a nice trip or have anything nice. The point is, going back to where we started with my ice cream problem, are you free not to indulge those so that on a larger scale you can live a life of generosity? So that you can live a life where you actually enjoy the master's joy. 
I want to be clear here that when we talk about generosity and finances, when it comes to finances, God doesn't want anything from you. I mean, Jesus paid his taxes with the fish's coin. It's not that God wants anything from you. He wants something for you, namely your freedom. For you to be able to look in the face of something and to be able to walk away because you have a higher priority than just having the next thing. And so what this means is that generosity ultimately is a demonstration of our freedom. And so in the time that we have left, I want to look at how do we share the master's joy? What are a couple of things that we can do to demonstrate our freedom? The first is Proverbs 22, 7. It says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. I want to be clear here that this is not Solomon saying this is how it should be. He's not prescribing that the rich should rule over the poor and the borrower should be slave to the lender. This is more of a description of reality, meaning we live in a reality where the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. And the reason that I bring this passage to us this morning is because when we live our lives leveraged to the max, Essentially what we are doing is we are giving someone else the power to tell us what to do with our finances. That yes, there are things that we have to borrow for, right? Mortgages, student loans, all of those kinds of things. But when we live leveraged to the max so that we can increase our standard of living, so that we can keep up with who and so and so down the street, whatever it may be, move into the next neighborhood, whatever it is, When the opportunity presents itself to be generous, we don't have the freedom to do it because there's someone else dictating, no, I get your first and your best. You have to pay this first. And so I want you to understand that the first way that we experience the master's joy is to live with a little bit of financial margin. To understand that financial peace is not found in having all the money we could ever want but it's found when there's margin between how much we make and how much we spend. There was a study done a few years ago where they went to people in different income brackets and and asked, how much would you need to feel content and secure financially? And so they went to people that had an annual income of about $30,000 and asked them, and on average they said $75,000. Then I would be content and secure. And then they went to people who on average made $100,000 a year, and their response was $150,000. Then I would feel content and secure. They went to people who made an average annual salary of $500,000, and the average response was a million dollars. And then they went to those who made an average annual income of a million dollars, and their answer was $5 million. The answer is not more money. The answer is finding margin so that we can rest in the master's joy. The second practical step that we can take is when we look at Jesus, another reason we don't see Jesus handle a lot of money is simply because for all we know, Jesus did not have much money. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Jesus himself being among the marginalized. And so what we see with Jesus above everything else is a spirit of generosity. And I know some of us do not find ourselves in a place right now where we have the resources to be financially generous. Maybe we are living on student loans because we're in college, you know, or whatever it may be, wherever we find ourselves, but what does it look like for us to have a spirit of generosity? What we see with Jesus is that Jesus leveraged what he did have to lighten the economic burden of those around him. He may not have had a ton of money, but he used his ability to multiply loaves and fish, to turn water into wine, to relieve the economic burden and pressure of those around him. 
How can we leverage what we do have to lighten the economic burden of those around us? Made the joke in the last service that pancake mix goes a long way. <laughs> you can make a lot of pancakes with a box of pancake mix. And so maybe it's just throwing that together and inviting some people over. But the point is, when we prioritize our finances in ways that reflect the master's heart, we experience sharing in the master's joy. To bring this kind of question about why Jesus entrusted his resources to Judas, to kind of bring that to a close, I believe on the most foundational level, the reason that Jesus entrusted the money bag to Judas was because he wanted Judas to know his own generosity towards him. And what I mean by that is the, the theologian Karl Barth said that Jesus gave the money back to Judas because he wanted Judas to know that he was on Judas's side even if he wasn't on Jesus's. What we see with Jesus is one who demonstrated a reckless generosity, an excessive generosity, a generosity beyond not only what was deserved, but quite honestly, what was necessary. He gave every bit of it. And when we discover Jesus' generosity to us, it changes how we view our generosity towards others. So I want to give us some time now as we move into worship and communion to just contemplate the generosity of Jesus towards us, to reflect on his abundant generosity. And so I want to invite you to bow your heads. We're going to have people available to pray if you would like to pray with somebody. Maybe you're experiencing or discovering Jesus' generosity for you for the first time. That in some way in our head we had this calculus that his generosity was something we had to earn. And we're learning and discovering for the first time that no, it is is abundant. And it is waiting for me to simply receive it. Let's reflect on that for a moment.